to see you. Thank you very much, Yahira, for remembering to record. I'm Petra Sultan, Director of Advocacy and Education for Thrive, the Alliance of Nonprofits for San Mateo County and co-chair of the, of the VIOC with my colleague, Diane. Hi, Diane Leeds with uh, co-chair of the VIOC and I'm also with San Francisco Peninsula People Power. And with Sarah O'Brien from the Elections Office. Hello, good morning. Um, so we've got a great agenda today. We have um, Jim Arizari, who is going to be um, presenting results from the recall election um, as far as turnout and all kinds of things, which is terrific. Um, I do want to mention this is a one hour meeting, not an hour and a half meeting. So we're going to all talk really, really fast. Um, the first thing I want to do is give a couple of announcements. I would love for everyone in the meantime to be uh, to introduce yourself in chat, your name, the organization, if you're an affiliated with an organization, and what your favorite um, area of San Mateo County is. It's your favorite neighborhood, and it can be the one you're living in, but it can also be one you like to go to to visit. So favorite neighborhood in San Mateo County is the prompt. Um, so um, looking forward to seeing the chat box fill up with everyone's introductions. And I want to tell you about something um, that is uh, completely hot off the press. Um, so I know that everybody in the room has heard me say redistricting is important. Um, and it's very important for voting. It's very important for political power. It's very important for community, um, for, for civic participation. But it turns out that it's really hard for people to engage. So even though we have been yelling about how important redistricting is, we have not had as many people come in to make comments um, as we would have liked on all kinds of levels of government. So um, Thrive is going to be over the next uh, week and a half, really, <laughs> eight days. Um, be, we're going to get together a group of nonprofits to try to come up with a unity map to present to the commission. If anyone is interested in hearing more on this, we're going to be working with the Asian Americans Advancing Justice and the Northern California ACLU are going to be providing technical support and mapping support. And we have uh, leaders of nonprofits. If anybody would like to join that very small super exclusive, very fun group. Um, it's gonna be working on hammering out some maps. Please let me know. Again, this is just another way to get people more involved in the redistricting process, um, but with some professional help because it's actually really hard. Um, so that's the first thing. A couple of other Thrive announcements. We have some fun events coming up. Um, I obviously think all of this is fun, so it's not fair when I say a fun event, but there you go. Uh, on October 28th, we actually have two events. One is our children and education group, which is going to be meet and, and talking about social emotional learning in this kind of post, almost post COVID era. Um, and also give an update on how to get state level funding. Then in addition to that, we have our climate group, um, environment and sustainability tag, where we're working on trying to get some uh, get everyone's input to get some collective climate goals for San Mateo County because we have a lot of groups working on a lot of things and we're trying to pull us together and get some uh, shared goals. On November 8th, um, we are working on pulling together a VOAD, Volunteer Organizations Active in Disaster for San Mateo County. We're one of the few counties that doesn't have one. So we're going to be doing an informational meeting with uh, Santa Clara County explaining how they created their VOAD. And so any organization that works on disaster relief um, uh, should be there. Um, ben, I'd like to talk to you about that uh, later on for sure. And then on November 16th. Absolutely. Pardon? Oh, I said absolutely, we will, for sure. Okay, great. And then uh, <coughs> November 16th with the League of Women Voters for North and Central County, we're doing a, um, a, an event around housing, SB9 and SB10 passed. What does that mean for your backyard? So 
Um, hopefully you guys can join us for that. That's a lot of events coming up. Hopefully one of them will strike your interest. And with that, um, like I said, we have only an hour today and we wanna make sure we have plenty of time for question and answer after Jim's presentation. So I will hand it over to Jim. You're on mute. It's going to be much more interesting if you take it off mute. Good morning. Do you hear me? Okay. We don't hear anything either, Mike. Okay. Jim, are you setting up your share screen? Yeah, we're there. Just okay. one second. Great. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me now? Just an affirmative would be good. Okay, good. <laughs> well, pleasure being here. It's always a, a great uh, morning to meet with you folks. Uh, we just had a tremendous election that our staff managed to put together under some very, very uh, trying conditions. Uh, normally, gubernatorial recall elections come under a statutory requirement that gives us, oh, quite a bit of time, almost two to three months to prepare for it. Um, but this time around, the state legislature changed the rules and shortened the time periods considerably, which means that we kind of had to be on our toes uh, to get the election going. I think the primary impact was that periods were shortened uh, and uh, the election was uh, going to be held originally in November, possibly uh, around this time, uh, October, early November. Uh, instead, it was on September 14th. So you can imagine the crunch that occurred on all aspects of the technology uh, for elections. You know, we have to get our vote centers in place. We have to have connectivity issues that we address. And of course, we have to develop the official ballot. We have to develop the sample ballot and get it out. All that was done in a very, very condensed period. And only because we have some of the best election professionals in the state were we able, I think, to do it admirably with very, very little um, glitches that surfaced. As a matter of fact, you know, there is no such thing as a perfect election, uh, but mechanically and technology wise, this is about as close as possible as you can get to a perfect election. And my hats are off to our staff for doing that. So let's go into the numbers a little bit so you can kind of give them, get an overview of uh, what we're talking about. Uh, this one had 440,000 registered voters, and I'll do a little comparison with the uh, 2020 election. Uh, we had, uh, of course, 46 candidates on there. There was only one seat up for election. There was three ballot styles. Uh, in the, for example, the presidential election, we had close to, you know, 300, uh, 400 ballots, so 399. Uh, and in this one, uh, not ballot styles per se, because we have one ballot style, we multiply by three uh, because we have English, Spanish, and Chinese. So the total number of ballot styles for this election was nine. Um, we had, of course, the one jurisdiction on the ballot that was statewide. We had one office, which was the uh, governor's office. Zero measures, zero propositions. Okay, going to the next. Uh, in terms of the actual infrastructure for the election, uh, of course, we're a vote by mail county. We had uh, RAVBM, which is remote accessible vote by mail. That was also utilized this election, not as high as I thought it could be, particularly in a COVID environment, but nonetheless, it was available for all of the population to use. Um, we had 42 uh, ballot drop box locations, 20 vote centers, uh, two pop-up vote centers over on the coast side, over in La Honda and Pescadero, which 
by the way, you know, surprised me, uh, even for a very short period of time that we had it up, up there. And it's a very sparsely populated area, as most of you are, are aware. Uh, we had some pretty good um, in-person turnout there on each day, uh, which gives credit to the pop-up concept, particularly in those areas that uh, are uh, rural and sparsely populated. People do need to use vote centers and those pop-up centers to serve that purpose. Uh, we had three ballot pickup service locations and we had curbside ballot drop-off at 10 of our busiest vote centers. Voting equipment and technology that we put in place, we had 128 ICX ballot marking tablets. Those are voting machines, basically. Uh, with that, we had uh, ballot printers. Of course, you know, if you do vote on a voting machine, you're marking the ballot, it is being printed, and then we eventually scan that. So we both have a paper ballot and a digital ballot, but those printers are used to print those ballots uh, that are marked on the machines. Uh, we had 42 uh, mobile ballot printers, which are the ones that are at our counters basically uh, to print any ballot that we might need in the county. Um, we had 72 10X poll books. Our, our e-poll book system, which we've deployed over the last uh, couple of elections, has been extremely valuable and efficient in processing uh, voters that come to the polls, but it also creates a dashboard with a bunch of information uh, that both staff and, and the public can use. The 10X poll book also gives us our vote center widget, uh, which allows on election day and the days before, really the weekend before, for people to uh, go on our website and see uh, the volume of traffic at vote centers. So you can select one that might not be as busy as, as another vote center. So that vote center widget, something I think we should be uh, kind of advertising and selling a little bit more uh, so people do not have to wait at the vote centers, although there are no lines at the vote centers this, this go around. But when you do get a big election, like a presidential, uh, that vote center widget is really critical. Uh, 22 cradle points. Uh, for those of you that don't know what a cradle point is, the, a cradle point is a, a secured connection. Basically allows us to create a VPN tunnel with encrypted information where we communicate all of our vote center and voter registration data to uh, the Secretary of State uh, a database, voter registration database, and that has to go through a secured uh, uh, VPN network or VPN tunnel. And uh, those credit points have come in extremely uh, valuable in our process because they have to penetrate the county firewall to get there. And uh, it, it's easy to say a credit point is very um, interesting and, and challenging to manage, but our staff, particularly Ivan uh, Berrigan, uh, has got that dialed in and those, those cradle points provide a very secure connection for each of our vote centers to uh, Sacramento. And in essence, it, it, it's like our Tower Road office. That's what we're doing. We're replicating our Tower Road office connection uh, over our vote center network. And those cradle points allow us to do that. Uh, we had 200 GPS ballot tracking devices. Uh, another innovative uh, device that was uh, proposed by staff and implemented uh, really last election. But the GPS ballot tracking, I think we're the only county in the state that does that. Uh, one night we were here, there's a presidential election, and uh, you know we had 45 vote centers out there, uh, and all we have our ballot boxes that have to come in on election day, and uh, we're waiting. We put them up on a bingo board so we know if they're coming in or not. And we were here till five o'clock in the morning until every ballot box was returned uh, to uh, Election Central. But we didn't know where they were at unless somebody reported it to us that it was on its way. So what staff did was we now have a GPS chip in each ballot box. That means that we can trace that ballot box wherever it is at on election day. So it's really interesting to see it on the board that's actually traveling from South San Francisco to uh, to San Mateo. And it is just a, a, an incredible uh, tool that we're using to make sure we know where every ballot box is at any moment in time. And it's my understanding we're the only county that has implemented such a ballot tracking system. 
Okay, uh, voter turnout. Um, here's a comparison with the 2020 general election. Um, basically, you know, we had 440,000 uh, voters in this election, slightly less than the general. Uh, total ballots received a lot less, 380 in the general, 292 in the recall, and the turnout was 66.30% uh, for this election, and the general election was uh, about the second highest uh, in the county's history at 85.89%. Uh, let's go on in a little asterisk down there. I'll talk a little bit about that. Let me see if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, and I'll cover that, that 94% coming in before election day. No, 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 stay where you're at. Um, um, this again is an overview of um, the election statistics and the ballot comparisons. Um, I think the most important thing is here, you know, we had 95.4% um, of the ballots came in by mail, meaning that just about, you know, 4.6% were voted at vote centers. Um, so by far and away, and it's, Probably the COVID environment, but also I think an extensive campaign by the VIOC, by the chief elections officer, uh, for people to vote early, uh, to vote from the ease and convenience of their home, to utilize vote by mail. That message has come through because vote center um, percentages in terms of ballots actually cast at vote centers goes as high as 15% in an election to as low as 4.6% in an election. This was one of the lowest uh, utilizations of vote centers on site, which is a good thing. Uh, vote centers are there not only to vote, but also to provide voter services. And we were doing a lot of that during this election. But it's an interesting statistic there that uh, by far and away, San Mateo County voters are using vote by mail rather than coming on site to cast their ballots. Um, and we covered those statistics. Uh, this next uh, chart here is interesting to look at, and I'm almost done because I know we want to go through this quickly. Um, as I said, more than 95% of the ballots were received before election day. So that really lowered the amount of people that were going to the vote centers. That lower line you can see is pretty much a flat line, that green uh, line right there. Uh, that was the attendance at vote centers during this election compared to previous elections. And you can see in previous elections, you have a spike on election day. That's when you get most in, and the weekend before really about E minus four. But in this election, and also in the uh, 2020 election, because we're one of the few counties that has a 30 day vote center network because the VCA doesn't require that. Uh, Mr. Church established that policy uh, long ago, and that is that we have 30-day vote centers um, in North Central and South County. So people actually start voting and, and dropping their ballots off very early in the process. And that, as you can see, flatlined the whole um, process of people coming to vote centers and voting uh, early. And you can see it was pretty much constant. So come election day, it was relatively quiet, um, where you can see in other counties on election day, particularly precinct counties or polling place counties, you'll see a real large spike in, um, in those numbers on election day and even long lines. And in San Mateo County, remarkably, even uh, in the November 3rd, 2020 election, which I expected could really impact lines at the vote centers. Because we're open 30 days earlier, because of our BBM process, um, we did not have any long lines at vote centers. Some, but not, not anything, uh, probably the longest wait was about 20, 30 minutes. Um, so anyway, this is a really good uh, chart that kind of puts things in perspective. We used uh, RAVBM um, and, you know, basically RAVBM is Remote Accessible Vote by Mail. As a reminder, we were the first county in the state of California to implement an RAVBM program. It was primarily for uh, voters with uh, uh, visual impairment, and it was now expanded in this COVID environment to anyone who could, uh, who wanted to use the system, could receive uh, their ballot at home on a link uh, on their computer, mark it, print it, and send it back to us. And as you can see, these are the numbers that um, we had in this election. Not a large percentage, but I'll tell you, for people who needed to use it, it was really very, very valuable service. 
The last and final area I want to cover here, and I won't spend too much time, we could probably spend the whole meeting on it, is the whole issue of cyber threats and cybersecurity. Uh, this, by the way, is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, uh, and the Secretary of State is doing a variety of, of activities. In fact, we're going to be part of a little symposium here statewide that talks about what we do here in San Mateo County uh, with respect to our cybersecurity defense structure. And this just gives a bird's eye view of the challenges that we have in elections. We are in a little cocoon in the middle behind the firewall of ISD. We're very protected there. That's a really strong firewall. You can only go through that firewall only with encrypted data or a VPN uh, tunnel connection. And ISD really monitors that very well uh, to the tune that you don't get emails coming in unless um, we get a lot of emails blocked because of that firewall. But it really protects our elections infrastructure. And then, of course, we work with the Department of Homeland Security, Department of Defense, Secretary of State, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation in uh, monitoring uh, cyber chatter and the issues that are out there. Um, again, a statistic that I mention a lot is, according to the Department of Homeland Security, our national infrastructure is being attacked literally every minute of every day. And this network here and this process that we have, um, which is an interagency process to protect our elections infrastructure, has been very efficient, um, but the threats are there and and um, and the end growing. But the particular area of threat right now that we are concerned about uh, is ransomware, and it's getting very sophisticated. And so um, every day, uh, because people are out there trying to make money. Now it's no longer undermining the integrity of elections, like from a malicious nation state actor. Now it's just criminal activity, nation state activity. Uh, that is out there uh, with ransomware actually trying to uh, make a buck. And, uh, and unfortunately, that has increased uh, over the last year or so. And you can read in the newspaper some of the challenges that other areas have had of the national infrastructure that has been shut down from uh, oil pipelines to water systems have been literally uh, shut down. So anyway, uh, we're doing very well. We meet monthly with our cybersecurity defense structure task force, and uh, we can deploy instantly our team if there's any incident that arises. On that note, I will open it up to any questions you might have. Thank you, Jim. I really appreciate all of those statistics and um, hearing about how the election ran very smoothly despite the tight time frame. Um, I'm sure there are questions in the audience. So who's got a question? Hello, Pedra. This is Brent. Brett, go ahead. Hi, uh, Jim. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, just put in the chat, you know, we're, we're still hopeful for more information. I know there's some conversations going on right now where Sam, uh, San Francisco County seems to be moving toward the trials in a live uh, election of the open source voting systems that have been um, advocated by the technology experts for, for so long. So we're hopeful that San Mateo County is also in that conversation and just wondering what your thoughts are. I know there was a mention of the voting centers perhaps being a, a bit of a um, issue around moving forward with the better technology. Do you think that uh, we might be addressing or at least uh, recognizing this issue for conversation and exploration? Absolutely, Brent. Uh, we, we, we conducted an extensive RFP, as you're aware, and I think the VIOC was also aware of our members, uh, to replace our voting system. We elected not to purchase a voting system, but to lease it, to give an opportunity to see how the open source community uh, evolves. Uh, there were no certified systems during our RFP that were open source that even submitted a proposal. I'm not saying it negatively, it's just there's, it's a really extensive certification process that uh, election uh, vendors have to go through. And, and unfortunately, during the process that we went through a couple of years ago, uh, we didn't receive any um, open source vendor uh, proposals. And we went with our Dominion voting system, which, by the way, has proven to be 
uh, a very effective, um, and they're good partners, very effective system. And uh, we believe that there's safety and security there. But nonetheless, we didn't purchase the system. We leased it to give ourselves the opportunity should, it gives up options, whether it's open source or another voting system. But we wanted to test our, our Dominion voting system. And that's the, the, the process that we're in right now. In terms of the, the, the technical aspects of it, in terms of a pilot project, one of the challenges that we have right now that we won't be able to participate with San Francisco on is that we really have quite a bit on our plate with redistricting going on. It's taking up a tremendous amount of our resources, very complex, very complicated project. So we have our, our resources going there. And of course, we're now preparing for the gubernatorial primary and general elections. And we don't wanna take our eye off the ball. We have you know only 19 staff members, we're at 18 right now. And we just don't have the bandwidth uh, to conduct a pilot project in the middle of an election of this nature. I think a pilot project could work in a small election where the whole system is uh, on, on pilot, but you can't do a large election and have a portion of it on pilot because again, you're not limited, voters are not limited to just going to one precinct polling place that we can control in a pilot. You know, you can get a voter coming to Redwood City from Daly City and then would be faced with a different machine uh, and, and system which could create some confusion. So uh, any pilot would have to be designed for a, uh, a vote by, a vote, how can I say, uh, a VCA type of election model. And it would have to be uniform for all participants in the election and not just one precinct or two, which is normally the way you know, a small pilot would work. So it doesn't work for a large election. It could possibly work for a smaller election. And, and that's what we would be uh, you know, open to looking at. But timing wise, unfortunately, we don't have the bandwidth right now uh, to, to do the pilot because of you know, all of the responsibilities we have on our desk. I think there's a lot of potential there. And you know we're certainly willing to do that, uh, especially if there's a certified voting system out there uh, that we can look at. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Diane. Yes. Hi. Um, thanks so much, Jim, for that that presentation. Quick question. <laughs> um, just curious as to what the split in terms of the ballots that you've got you've showing that were returned uh, vote by mail what the split is between those that actually came through the US Postal Service versus being dropped off, you know, just with all of the, the talk about what's going on at the Postal Service and delays and in, in um, delivering of, of mail. Uh, do we have a, a feel for what the split is between those two methods. You I don't have Sarah do you have any or Hillary do you have any idea on that split. Um, with the uh, U.S. Postal versus, you know, um, the, uh, I was just about to look it up, so okay. I'll, I'll look it up right now. We, we have okay. we have yeah, the statistic, just... yeah. But I, I would like to say, Diane, that uh, uh, U, UPS has been a very good partner. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going through some changes now. I mean, up until this election, we've had a pretty solid relationship uh, with the San Francisco District Office. Uh, we've had, you know, staff that's been there for a long time that has been with us really from the beginning of the VBM process in San Mateo County since 2015. And believe me, they are a partner. They have to be uh, in a vote by mail environment. You can't get around it, right? Uh, they're integral. They're, they're critical. And they have really performed well. Um, there are challenges, though, that there's changes going and uh, we haven't experienced that yet, and I hope that we won't. Uh, Mr. Church, you know, likes to make sure that we are in touch with the um, it, uh, district administrator of the U.S. Postal Service uh, to make sure that they understand the importance of elections and the democracy. Um, and so what, what we do with, with the USPS is, and they've been really great at that they have a a training session with all of their postmasters before every election and a directive comes down that all of our ballots are treated as hot mail meaning that as soon as it comes through it gets segregated out and gets processed more than and quicker than any other mail even though we don't pay for first class per se you know um, right. they treat it as as hot mail so they've been really really good um 
and and we, we expect that it'll continue that way although there are constant challenges when people leave yeah well again my, my bigger concern isn't so much about what's actually happening more about people's perception of of how quickly things get delivered through the mail so um but yeah it's great that we have such a good relationship with with the, the local postal folks you know and, and diane maybe that is why uh and, and you that's a really good point because that is why we see a lot of people dropping their ballots off at vote centers and curbside. Uh, and it's not a new phenomenon here uh, with the VCA. That was happening when we were in a polling place environment. And again, we had 65% of our uh, registered voters were uh, permanent VVM. And even then, they wouldn't send it in the mail. They would drop it off at the vote centers. And uh, we were really surprised that you could just you know, we paid the stamp, we can kind of send it in, but people would still like to hand it to an elections official. And that is the dynamic we still see today. All right, thank you. And thanks, Sarah, for putting the, the numbers in the chat. I'm actually curious on, I don't know if you have this number. No, sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know if you have this number at the top of your head, uh, off the top of your head, but um, you said that our turnout was 66.3%, which for this election, which was, as we all know, hard to drum up enthusiasm about. That actually sounds nice and high. Do you know what it was for the whole, for all of California? 50s. Uh, Hillary, do you have that? You were on top of those numbers uh, all the time. Um, and I have a report here on that. But we led the state for sure. We were higher than the state. And the state, I thought, was like in the neighborhood of around 53 or 54 percent. You have that number, Hillary, you can bump up? But yes, we, we, were, we, were, we were far outpacing. As a matter of fact, an interesting, uh, well, she's looking for that, an interesting uh, stat that San Mateo County had the largest in-person voting in this election for the first, uh, up until E minus 10. And that means we were beating LA, we were beating Orange County, we were beating the largest counties in the state in terms of people actually being able to come to a vote center, most of the state's polling place. Uh, but we were actually the lead county in the state up until LA and Orange County opened their vote centers. But prior to that, our, our voters had the opportunity to go to vote centers throughout the county. And it, it was evidenced in, in the statistics that we were the number one county for in-person voting all the way up until the 10-day vote centers opened up in LA and Orange County. Got any numbers there, Hillary? Yeah, it's in the chat, 58.4% statewide. There you go. Jim, this is Mike. Hi, Mike. Yeah, I had two questions. One was similar to the last question, and that is, do we have the statewide numbers for absentee or for vote by mail? We're 95.4 for our county, but I was thinking the state was still pretty high, too. This, well, well, those will be more difficult to pull out. Oh, well, yeah, okay. they, they would be. But, but one of the things that did occur, of course, was uh, that for this election, similar to the presidential election, uh, every registered voter in the state of California did receive a ballot in the mail, whether they were VCA County or not. They were having their own challenges, not having the type of network that we have. Uh, but I would venture to say that uh, that was a very, very large percentage, very large. And percentage. does the drop does the drop box count as vote by mail, or is that count as election in person? Uh, could you repeat that question again? I'm sorry. Yeah, Dropbox, like if you're dropping it off at a Safeway or whatever the drop boxes are, is that vote by mail or is that a considered a vote in person? Vote by mail. Yeah, that's what I thought. Vote by okay, mail. Okay, and then I had one last question, and that's on the uh, sheriff and DA and et cetera, et cetera, being moved to the presidential year. I think it was 759, AB. 759, yes. Was that signed in? Will there be a 2022? No, it turned in. It turned into a two-year bill, and that, that's okay. being that was being discussed. And we're going into a meeting this afternoon to find out a little bit more about that. So there will be a 2022 primary for all those people on June. Oh yes, yes. Okay. June, June 2022. Yes. 
Do you, Jim, is there anything you want to tell us about the June election now that you have us all here? Anything we should um, know in advance or start thinking about? Well, I, the biggest challenge that we have right now, of course, is uh, districting, redistricting. Uh, and that is critical to the uh, 2022 election. And just like everything that's been going on uh, with the recall election, we're in a crunch time uh, with redistricting and having to get those maps together. So that's first and foremost on our plate. We're trying to move up the uh, submittal of maps uh, to April, we were shooting for May 12th uh, to have all of the shape files in, but because of some of the new developments, we're trying to get jurisdictions to get their shape files to us by uh, April 12th, and then that'll allow us to begin the process of uh, developing the uh, sample ballot, official ballot, and, and the uh, elections infrastructure for those elections. Uh, at this stage, we've got a very good election model that has worked very well, uh, both in gubernatorial and presidential elections. We do not anticipate any changes to that. Uh, the area that I think needs to be emphasized is, as we have uh, and taken somewhat of a leadership role in the state on this one, uh, is uh, voter education and outreach. Uh, I think that that more and more is uh, proving to be uh, uh, an essential uh, component of a successful uh, vote by mail, vote center environment. People need to be informed and uh, you will see that there will be funds allocated for that purpose. And I believe the model that we have had with the Silicon Valley uh, Center to uh, Valley Foundation uh, will continue into the future. That was a really good uh, business model that we've established that I, I would see uh, into the future for these two elections. Did Jim, I want to see this statewide oh. stats I just posted. Yes, thank you, Hillary. Okay. Um, uh, but Jim, I really want to thank you for the relationship you've built with the community through the VIOC and with the funding through Silicon Valley Community Foundation for Outreach. Um, I don't know if everybody on the call knows this, but we really are a statewide model. I had uh, the executive director of California Common Cause reach out to me and ask me how that how they can share with San Diego how we're doing it because San Diego has said that they can't do that and Jonathan's like yes they can San Mateo's <laughs> doing it so um we have a lot to be proud of here and I really appreciate I just sounded like Jim but we do we you know this this relationship is really um unique and it definitely is a model and I, I've been hearing that from a lot of different places. So thank you very much for all of that. You're and more than welcome. And thank you, Petra. You know, and, and while we're giving kudos, quite honestly, this is a, a mutually beneficial relationship because we would not get the funding if it wasn't for the support that you've given as a group and individually and collectively uh, to before the Board of Supervisors to get the money allocated. We can propose, uh, but ultimately the board funds and the board was very receptive uh, to Mr. Church's proposal and to your presentations. So we have support from the top to the bottom. And that's what's necessary to put a program like this together because the money ultimately is allocated by the board and we have a board that's been very receptive to that. And thank you um, for all of the board members there that have been part of us all the way along. Any other questions for Jim before we move on to legislative updates? Okay. Session finished in Sacramento and Governor Newsom signed some bills and vetoed some bills. So Diane, you're up. Okay. Yeah. So um, basically I'm going to cover um, the status of some of the bills that we've been following and essentially the three um, that we were mostly watching. So AB 37, which was the one that um, codifies sending every registered voter a, a, a mail ballot um, that, that was signed by, by Governor Newsom. The other, th the, the part of that, that law that really directly affects us is it also extended the length of time that a vote by mail ballot can be returned and counted. So it's now seven days. So it used, uh, originally it was what three days after election day, then it was extended um, for the, the November 2020 election. Um, but now it's it's at seven days moving forward, which is which is great. Um, 
SB 503, which is related to signature verification, that also was signed by the governor. Um, and basically what that does is it just, um, it, it, it basically adds more layers of review with the goal that we want to accept every signature that we possibly can. So you have to have um, three elections officers have to review a signature before it can be rejected. So that also was signed. And then finally, the uh, AB 796, which is the new motor voter uh, law base is, is also one that was signed um, by Governor Newsom. And it just codified some of the uh, provisions that were in a legal settlement. It establishes a, a, a task force between the Secretary of State and the Department of Motor Vehicles to essentially improve um, the, the um, transference of information from when people go into the DMV to either update their information or, or sign up for a new driver's license or ID card to make sure that that works a lot more smoothly. Because as we all probably remember from years ago, it's, it's been a bit of a bumpy road getting, getting that motor voter um, law to, to work effectively. So those three main um, election bills were all signed uh, by Governor Newsom. The, the other one I wanted to cover that we talked about briefly was AB 339, which was uh, a law that was trying to um, put in place um, moving forward that there would always be internet access to public meetings, similar to what we've had in place because of the COVID. Um, you know, unfortunately, while that, that bill was um, going through the legislature, it was watered down significantly. Um, and it did pass both the Assembly and the Senate, um, but it, it basically put a restriction that only jurisdictions with 250,000 or more residents would be affected by this bill. And Governor Newsom vetoed it. Um, and the reasons that he gave for vetoing it was he, he didn't like the fact that you were setting um, he, he was afraid they were setting a precedence of tying public access to the size of the jurisdiction. He also thought that it would be very confusing uh, for people to know whether or not um, this, this internet access, those you know, Zoom meetings, virtual meetings had to be provided or not. He also thought that it um, limited flexibility and increased costs for the jurisdictions that were affected. So in a way, I think it's probably good news because I think most of us were not very happy with the, the amendments that were made to that bill. It just watered it down so much that it just wasn't going to really provide that ongoing, easy access for, for people um, in, for most jurisdictions. Um, so, so that's just kind of a very quick rundown. So the three voting bills did get signed and the public access one uh, was vetoed. Any questions from anyone? Mike, uh, I have a question on 339 that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So going forward, I, did I, I don't know if I heard that the original emergency status or whatever that allowed uh, vote meetings mm -hmm. was extended, but if this doesn't get be approved or passed in next session, are there going to be places cutting off remote voting and a lot of people that are not going to be participating in public meetings very much anymore. So, so it doesn't affect remote. If you're talking about remote accessible vote by mail, it doesn't affect that. It's just, but yeah, the public, no, no, public meetings. meetings. I'm talking about public yeah. meetings. Yeah. Because I know well, one of the issues they did was they they changed internet and phone access to internet or phone access, which mm -hmm. was already going to be confusing because you right. have to figure out which options you have before you decide which meetings you're going to go. Right, right. And so is any of that going to be remedied next year or is it dead? I mean, it, it could be reintroduced. Um, again, I can't really say how likely it would be to pass if it was introduced again. Um, I think this is where um, public input is probably important. I, I think right now it's you know, because most of most of the meetings are still available by phone and by internet, um, I think once that that access gets cut off, I think it's it's really behooves people to get in touch with their representatives to try to reintroduce the bill. You know, the, the problem was is when this bill was introduced, it was a, you know it was opposed by the League of California Cities, 
uh, the California State Association of Counties. So there were a lot of large government organizations that did not like the bill. Um, I'm not sure if that's because they felt it was it was going to be too costly to implement on an ongoing basis. But you know, the changes that were made to that bill just made it not very effective for the majority of of the population. So um, I, I've, I've been lobbying for that bill for a year. And yeah. I talked to the author's office. I talked to the local legislators that represent me, and they're not involved in the revisions, obviously, but it was really the assembly chair that I heard was the one who initiated all the watering down amendments. Mm -hmm. So uh, one thing, well, just one point, which is that locally, I mean, everywhere people can do what they want. I mean, it would be good to have a baseline and to have everyone do this. And I absolutely hope that they take this up again and figure out a way to get this passed because it's, to me, it seems like a really great bill as far as public participation. But in the meantime, our local bodies of government can decide to do whatever they want to do. So advocating on a local level to continue having the all of this um, is worthwhile in the meantime. So sure, don't forget that. Thank you. And thank you, Mike, for your work on advocating for that. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, it's not <laughs> something that affects me directly, obviously. Yeah. But it's, well, I think one of the things that the pandemic has shown that it's not just, um, that, that it actually is helpful for everyone, mm -hmm. uh, even if it's just that you have a lack of transportation. Right. Yeah, well, would, I, I wouldn't be at this meeting, you know, I have an 11 o'clock Zoom call and there's no way I could go to this meeting in person and then the ride to get to my 11 o'clock meeting in person and whatever, you know, I, I would be in transportation all day long. That That's all I have on, on legislation. So I guess the, the next thing I was supposed to cover is National Voter Registration Day, which was September 28th. Um, so San Francisco Peninsula People Power, this is our fourth year um, doing outreach on, on National Voter Registration Day. This year we went to seven different libraries um, and, as well as Eastside Preparatory High School in, in East Palo Alto. Um, one of the things that we added after I made a presentation to the Board of Supervisors, uh, Supervisor Slocum wanted to know why North Fair Oaks Library wasn't included. Um, part of that was confusion because the library kind of changed ownership, it went from being part of the Redwood City Library System to part of the San Mateo County Library System. So anyway, we were able to make adjustments. So we were at Daly City, East Palo Alto, Foster City, Half Moon Bay, North Fair Oaks, uh, Redwood City, San, and San Carlos. And again, in addition to East Side Prep. Um, not too surprisingly, it was very quiet. Um, and, you know, it Unlike when we did it last year, we had the presidential election as a way, even though most people in San Mateo County are registered, um, it still gave us an opportunity to talk about you know, where to go to drop off their ballot or if they had questions about um, the information they had received. This time, we really didn't have that, that hook. You know, The recall election was over. We did try to talk about redistricting, learn that it's, it's really hard to have an elevator pitch for redistricting. Um, I did get some people in Half Moon Bay because the coastal people are very, very involved and interested in what's going on with the, the Board of Supervisor redistricting, but um, it was hard to get a lot of people in other locations interested in talking about it. Um, so again, we didn't really, you know, we didn't really register anyone at the libraries. We did a lot of pre-registration at Eastside Preparatory, which we've done for, we've been there, I don't know how many years now. Um, so again, for next year, we're going to look at, yet again, going someplace other than libraries, because even though we were in some locations like North Fair Oaks at East Palo Alto, where registration rates are lower than the average, um, people just really weren't interested in talking to us. Part of that could be we weren't part of the community, <laughs> um, and they're like, okay, we're, we're just going to go do our business, and yeah, thanks. Talk to you later. Um, 
the, the one thing that that we you know was good was it we were able to provide information to the libraries like at North Fair Oaks they didn't realize um, that homeless you know unhoused people can still register to vote even if they don't have a physical you know address that you could just put down a physical location so um, so that was really valuable and and we're thinking about working with them uh, for when they have um, food distributions. Maybe that's a way for us to get to the unhoused population. Um, it also was valuable that we had information about the new um, bill where people on parole can register to vote. So again, even though we didn't do a lot of voter registration, we still were able to do some outreach, a little bit on redistricting and also helping the libraries um, you know, with a little bit more information about, about voting. But again, I think next year, um, partly just to keep, you know, our folks <laughs> that are doing, that are, you know, staffing the tables interested um, is um, finding some better places um, to talk to people um, about voter registration. Um, or again, next year we will have a, 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 an election that will be of a lot more interest. So hopefully that will generate a little bit more activity. But so National Voter Registration Day is really more about information and less about getting new people registered to vote, especially in San Mateo County, because we've got a pretty high registration rate. Any, any questions from anyone? Thanks for the report, Diane, and thanks for doing that. Um, we are going to be really generous today and give you back five minutes of your time. Um, we are, the next third Wednesday of the month is the week before Thanksgiving. So I think we could still do it. Um, so we'll have our next meeting on November 17th, but we'll just do an hour again. And then when things get uh, busier, we will um, have a longer one. Uh, Jim? I, I hate to be the, the Grinch that stole Christmas here, but I'm gonna take a couple of minutes of those five minutes that you just gave everybody back. Um, and, and I just wanted to let you know that uh, we're embarking upon a very uh, important project and that is the ADA improvements of Tower Road. Uh, we did get a million dollars allocated this year in our budget uh, for, uh, aid, for bringing the facility uh, completely up to ADA uh, requirements. Uh, the VAC has been working tirelessly on that. We've met with the Commission on Aging. We're now meeting with the Department of Public Works. And we have a, uh, a consultant, MWA, that did our original study that's working on that right now. So you'll be hearing more of that. But the exciting part is that we do have the money. It's allocated. It's on the capital uh, plan and budget for DPW. Uh, it will probably exceed a million dollars. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, but given the magnitude of the um, improvements that have to be done, but we're looking at some really fantastic things. The, our, our commission was, our committee was very successful in uh, convincing DPW to not cross our parking lot with a, a ramp uh, for ADA accessibility, which would have really been uh, terrible and was successful in arguing for a elevator. Uh, that will allow folks to park at the bottom and have access to our facility on both floors, which we don't have right now. So there were some really major accomplishments that was kind of done, you know, quietly uh, by the back. Uh, our hats off to them and, and Ben in particular, but the whole commission uh, uh, there was just really fantastic. And so we're embarking upon that, that, that project right now. And we will be seeing probably in beginning January, 2023, uh, the actual physical improvements. Between now and then, we are developing the plan. Just want to take a few minutes for, from you. Right. Wanted to and, let and, you know and, that. And the VIOC also sent a letter in support of those, those improvements to the Board of Supervisors. So hopefully that, that had some help as well. You, you guys are... Fantastic, right? You know, I, I absolutely, and that, that's why we are so successful is because we do have that, you know, citizen involvement uh, in, in this process and, and support, but yes, goes without saying, you guys uh, always are tremendously helpful in, in, in that process. Okay, so with that, we'll see you on November 17th. And um, 
if you have things that you want to bring up and you want to send them to me or Diane in advance, that would be great. And thank you to your Yahira for all of her support and to the elections office for all of your presentations. Totally appreciate it and have a great day.